welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to the Madden America podcast and our first episode of 2019. And this week we interview Professor Jim Van Os. Professor Van Os is chairman of the Division of Neuroscience at Utrecht University Medical Center, Utrecht, the Netherlands, and visiting professor of psychiatric epidemiology at King's College Institute of Psychiatry in London. He trained in psychiatry in Casablanca, Bordeaux, and the Maudsley Royal Hospital in London. We last spoke with Jim for the podcast in August 2017, and this time we focus on a recent paper written by Jim and co-authors that was published in the journal World Psychiatry in January 2019. Okay, Jim, um, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me again for the Madden America podcast. And we last spoke in late 2017, and it seems fitting to talk again because recently published in World Psychiatry is a paper by yourself and others that I think is is quite bold and it's very thought-provoking in its assessment of some of the limitations of our current response to mental health difficulties. And so your your paper poses some critical questions about the evidence base we use, focus on target symptom reduction as an outcome measure, and professional stratification within disciplines. And so if it's okay, I, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about that paper and, and some of the issues raised. And so to begin, yeah, the title of the paper itself uh, is quite something. It, it's entitled The Diagnosis Evidence-Based Group-Level Symptom Reduction Model as Organizing Principle for Mental Health Care, Time for Change. So maybe to, to start with, to kind of unpack that a little before we get to some of the specifics, can you help me understand what the diagnosis evidence-based group-level symptom reduction model is and, and how it might inform how we currently respond to mental health concerns? Yeah, so thanks for that question. Actually, the title was a lot longer because we also had added symptom reduction, routine outcome monitoring uh, etc. Uh, uh, behind it, but the editor thought the title would be too long. What we wanted to show is that uh, uh, we think that uh, more and more in many uh, Western countries, at least, mental health services are organized by uh, two parties, uh, the funders and the mental health professionals. And uh, these have found each other in a model of uh, products that can be uh, described, that can be uh, monitored, uh, that can be reimbursed, that are malleable, that are controllable. And it it seems that they have found each other in this thinking and that we on our part, the professionals, have reinvented the art of dealing with mental health health difficulties as something that professionals uh, look at through uh, a prism of diagnosable diseases, uh, which, according to a medical model, can be treated using uh, algorithms derived from evidence-based practice and scientific research. And, um, of course, that can be evaluated quite uh, reliably using measures of symptom reduction. So we, we're quite happy with a sort of curative model of evidence-based practice. And the funders like that because it, it can be then used as a product. Uh, you know, and you can calculate how many products you, you would need in a population of 10,000 and what that would cost and whether then people can compete with each other, uh, showing more or less symptom reduction so that you can uh, have a sort of market model of mental health difficulties and that those organizations that are the best at symptom reduction uh, actually will get more funding. So both parties are very happy in that model. Uh, the only thing is it, it, uh, there where mental health services are evaluated in countries, the, the data shows it doesn't work. And that's very interesting. So the, the curative medical model applied to mental health difficulties at the population level uh, is very attractive because it allows for control and malleability and uh, you know reliably 
resourcing the services, but um, it doesn't work. Thank you. That that was really helpful. And and maybe then to 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 perhaps dig into some of the reasons why it doesn't work or it doesn't appear to work. So if we start at the diagnosis end, because you know diagnosis seems to me you know the gateway for so many people to the mental health system and perhaps if we get that interaction wrong somehow then it can influence much of the rest of a person's journey so is there a risk then that because of the dominance of this perhaps diagnosis-led approach that we might be trying to fit people into a diagnostic category rather than perhaps recognize their individual circumstances or characteristics well, exactly. So um, mental suffering is a very broad concept. And, you know, the, the interpretation of that uh, uh, has to depend on the narrative of the person and the circumstances the person is, is, is living in. So that's a very complicated, you know, personal process of interpretation and uh, narrative uh, describing circumstances. However, if, if we think that uh, mental suffering is simply adding up what we call recognizable symptoms in algorithms, and that these are then diagnosed as if it were uh, as if they were nosological entities. Uh, you know, implicitly, of course, uh, thinking they they are brain based, and then requiring biological treatments or technical psychological treatments. Then that will very much detract from what uh, people tell us who have had the experience of mental difficulties, namely that it is very much a process of finding your way uh, in in the realm of personal difficulties and finding words to describe, you know, to develop a narrative of these difficulties and recognizing where in your particular circumstances and life history uh, these are significant and understanding it and then building resilience uh, with respect to that very personal background. So the, the, the problem is that from the medical perspective or the, the mental health care perspective, all mental suffering is uh, subsumed under a diagnostic heading of illness, losing track of the personal circumstances and uh, life histories of people uh, bringing you know, to the attention of the professional complaints. Um, And it differs entirely from what experiential knowledge or user knowledge has been telling us over the years. So this article very much was actually an attempt to bring together user knowledge about mental suffering and professional knowledge about mental suffering and to see whether you could somehow build a synthesis of these two types of knowledge that seem very much to clash um, and that is now very obvious in all mental health services, I think, in Western countries, that, that we need to do something to bring about that synthesis. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I was really encouraged, Jim, to see, you know, lived experience and personal experience put front and center in the paper because, you know, that that to me, you know, th- there are many kinds of experts in mental health, aren't there? And, and some are biological experts, but there are experts by experience that have lived this every day and, you know, perhaps need a better a seat at the table and a better chance to in- influence not just treatments, but how services are set up. So I was really keen, you know, to see that spelt out in the paper. And and Jim also, um, you know, th- this is a difficult question to ask, you know, someone in your position, but I've heard you previously use the term vulnerabilities uh, in place of uh, specific diagnoses, and I much prefer that to, to much of the standard diagnostic language. But I, I, I do still wonder if there's an element, even with such careful language of that, of um, unintentionally still locating the problem within the individual when I'm not saying this applies for all mental health concerns, but a good deal of mental health concerns could well be circumstantial or environmental things and you know so you know i just wondered you know is there a way that we can uh you know as we move away from perhaps diagnoses and more towards individual experience how we can also make it plain that a good deal of what we call mental health is actually external to us not something broken within people yeah no you're entirely right so uh, the way we use vulnerability actually is to to describe it at, at if you like at the population level and then what we really mean is, uh, uh, perhaps a better word, is to describe mental variation at the population level. And menti- mental variation at the population level uh, uh, has very much to do with 
uh, uh, circumstances. And um, I think, so, so that's why it's so interesting. If, I, I think it would be better perhaps to speak of uh, mental variation or mental variation in the way people react to the environment. And uh, that maybe is a very good model uh, to use, only the words, of course, are not very amenable to uh, everyday use. But the, the concept behind it is that we vary in the way we react to the environment. Uh, and that each of us, uh, sooner or later, because this is distributed in the population, how we react to the environment, that sooner or later, everybody is going to have a moment where he or she discovers, uh, you know, has, a, has a, an experience that, that is out of the ordinary, where you feel, I, you know, this is something I have to deal with. Uh, when there is a life circumstance, when you react in a way that brings about, uh, you know, your, 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 your particular type of variation. Um, but, you know, in building this paper, it was a bit difficult to, 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 to very much go into that. But I think language and the way we describe language and mental variation in terms of how people react to the environment uh, and that you can modify that and learn from it, that that's basically, that should be the core message, of course, of any uh, language that is used to help people deal with experiences. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And and I, I, I guess towards that point then, the, the paper leans towards wanting broader transdiagnostic syndromes, perhaps. That seems to me to be counter to the trend both in the DSM and the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, which seem to have added more and more discrete diagnoses out over time. And I know, Jim, you, you yourself described previously about trying to get trans chapter kind of syndromes or trans chapter spectrums in the dsm and they were they ended up as an appendix rather than you know perhaps being as, as front and center as they needed to be so you know it, it's clear that a number of professionals have vested interests in discrete diagnoses so you know how do we how do we even start to go about perhaps rolling back that trend of adding more discrete diagnoses yeah so I think I'm, I'm a bit optimistic there. Um, so the, the transdiagnostic dimensions didn't make it into the main uh, book, but I think ICD may look different. So the ICD people actually uh, are taking these transdiagnostic dimensions more seriously, but also perhaps more importantly, uh, even in the DSM now, you see a movement towards describing things as spectra. So the, the first spectrum uh, diagnosis now in DSM-5 is uh, 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 autism spectrum disorder, which is interesting because it really comes down to saying, well, there is a, a range of behaviors and experiences that we don't understand very well. That's why we call it a spectrum. And depending on the environment you're in, it can be advantageous or disadvantageous. That's basically how you can read the description of the spectrum disorder in DSM-5. And uh, you may have noticed that also addictive behaviors is now also described as a spectrum in DSM-5 because there's simply 11 criteria. And what they say is the more criteria, uh, criteria a person meets, the more severe the addiction syndrome is. So that's also moving towards a, a spectrum of severity of a particular variation of human experience and behavior. So it becomes a lot more agnostic. And I think DSM-6, if ever there's going to be a DSM-6, I think uh, there will be something like a, a psychosis spectrum syndrome, uh, rather than now having schizophrenia, schizoaffective, schizophrenic form, and all these different diagnostic categories that clearly science shows are, are basically very broad uh, uh, syndromes that are part of a spectrum of experiences and behaviors that, that is not just seen in those who uh, visit mental health services, but indeed can be picked up in the general population. So, so I'm optimistic that science will show us that all these labels and using them in clinical practice actually is not very useful. 
great. That's really helpful, Jim. Thank you. And and then if we can kind of move on a little bit into a bit more of the model. So you, you also talk about symptom focus in the paper, and, and you talk about the focus on target symptom reduction as an outcome measure for both for assessing treatment success. And, you know, and of course, symptom reduction, you know, understandably is the mainstay of many pharmacological approaches to mental suffering. But I, I just wondered if you felt the fo- if the focus on symptom reduction, you felt maybe it led to poor or less considerate care and maybe reduce the involvement of the person in their own recovery to a certain extent. Uh, so I think very much so. And, and you can look at this from different points of view. You can look at it uh, you know, through the prism of public health and epidemiology. So you can say, well, the, the morbidity load of mental suffering is considerable because the yearly prevalences are 20%. Uh, and we, we, we see that uh, curative models of care focusing on symptom reduction uh, which 90% of the randomized controlled trials in mental health care are about, clearly is not functioning. Because no matter how much we treat and how many evidence-based symptom reduction treatments we fire away at the general population, the morbidity load doesn't change at all. So it's an extremely silly model, actually, when you think of it, to have a curative model of care for a... Uh, morbidity load or type of suffering that that is cannot be uh, cured away with these treatments. Clearly, that's what the epidemiological evidence shows. And then, of course, we have considerable user knowledge now and also uh, epidemiological knowledge that uh, symptom reduction in, in the short term certainly can be beneficial in, in, uh, to a degree but that if you look over the life course of individuals uh, with mental difficulties, then what they will tell you after 10 years or 20 years is that they have come to see it as something they have learned to live with given their particular life circumstances and given their particular life histories. Going through a process of, of getting to know this particular way to react to circumstances uh, and finding uh, particular adaptations uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of of, of your life goals and uh, your lifestyle in how to deal with this and, and, and have a fulfilling life. And that's an entirely different story where symptom reduction certainly plays a role, but not the main role, not nearly. And what they often say is that if only somebody at the very beginning of this trajectory had explained to me that what I have to do is work in uh, recovering literally, uh, you know, what my life is about and how I should try to adjust my life goals and how I should find ways of, uh, of, of developing my resilience in learning to live with these particular uh, difficulties I have given the circumstances in, in my life history. And, and that's a different model. So if you if that becomes the core of the mental health services from the very beginning, you're going there and somebody explains this to you and then says, well, symptom reduction can, can play a role. And, you know, we've got, we've got different treatments you can try. But the long-term trajectory is this. Um, so I think that is really uh, what we have learned from this, this synthesis of user knowledge and professional knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in the paper, you, you say um, restoration of health is not the goal. It is the means to enable a person to find and pursue meaningful goals. Accordingly, the person's existential values become central. And, uh, you know, that quote really kind of stood out to me because that that seemed to summarize to me that this is much more than merely symptom reduction. Yeah, I think what is interesting is that in, in somatic medicine, this is now uh perhaps more accepted than in uh, mental health services in somatic medicine i think professionals very rapidly are moving towards what is called the third era of medicine where uh, doctors and nurses and those providing healthcare are more of a coach uh, telling you what bits of the technique technological stuff they have to offer you can use in order to uh, live your life and, and, and meet the goals 
uh, you want to meet in, in, in life. So they're there to assist you with your life and they have, you know, uh, some tricks they can assist. And this is now, I think, the third era of medicine is, 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 is understanding this message. Whereas in mental health care, maybe it has been more difficult, perhaps because we want so much, particularly in psychiatry, to resemble medical care. And we think medical care is all about technological interventions, uh, you know, uh, providing symptom reduction. So in my hospital, I see the cardiologist talking about, you know, the, the existential domain and helping, you know, that, that the, the need to really know who's sitting, uh, who's sitting uh, in, in, in the consulting room with you and getting to know their, their, their challenges and their life goals in order, in, because otherwise you can't provide medical treatment. It, it would be given, uh, you know, disconnected from what the person uh, wants to achieve in life. So this model, uh, developing sensitivities towards the existential domain, which really is, you know, uh, what gives meaning to people's lives, uh, what are values in their lives, and then measure the possibility of your intervention against those values. That's really that's really what medicine is trying to do now. And that's of course what what the recovery movement has been suggesting us, you know, to us for the last forty years to also move in that direction in mental health care. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And and just just a final question about the kind of symptom led focus. You, you also talk in the paper very much about the stratification of expertise that's occurred in such that, you know, a person with a mental health problem may well ultimately see a number of different professionals with different specialities and they have different approaches and different goals. So I just wondered if you felt this stratification itself was a symptom of our diagnosis and symptom led approach. Yes, I'm afraid so. Um uh, I think there's different sources. So, for example, the professional stratification is 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 interesting. For example, we have psychologists who give psychotherapy, and we have uh, doctors who provide medications. Uh, but then, if you look critically at the evidence, the scientific evidence of actually what mediates improvement if people improve on these uh, treatments, then. Uh, the need for to see them as stratified is 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 less convincing because there's considerable evidence that why these treatments work is not so much because of the technological ingredients like the molecules in the antidepressants and the technical ingredients of the psychotherapies, but rather that it is about a ritual, meaningful encounter between two people with some very powerful elements in it, namely trust and you know, disclosure and relationship. Uh, and that in those settings, apparently people are able to help themselves feel better uh, in the hope and the expectations in these ritualized uh, professional encounters they have. And that's very interesting. So it's, of course, you need a treatment, but the treatment functions more as a ritual within these very important relational contexts that helps people make uh, themselves feel better. So there's not so much difference between the technological treatments of psychiatrists and psychologists if you look at the evidence. So this is really fascinating, I think, and it also shows where the professional evidence perhaps is meeting uh, user knowledge because uh, user knowledge very much tells us that it is about connectedness uh, and 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 you know working on on, on a sense of uh, purpose that really helps people grow beyond the effects of you know the the particular mental difficulties they had. So perhaps we 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 shouldn't be stratified there. Perhaps we we've got more in common. But a very important area of stratification is uh, that 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 everywhere uh, people struggle with is the, the the differentiation between social care and medical care. Um, so the the social care and medical care uh, in virtually all countries have different bureaucracies and different money flows that are not talking to each other. 
So, for example, in the Netherlands, we spend six billion on uh, mental health care, and the same people treated in mental health care also receive six billion in social care. But the way the monies are allocated and spent are completely separated from each other, and the people in the two bureaucracies don't know of each other and don't work with each other. And of course, patients don't exist of a social domain and a uh, symptom domain. It's all integrated, and they very much need an integrated approach, social care and medical care. And this is now becoming a big problem. And, and there's, there's, you know, each week there's an academic dissertation on this topic on how on earth are we going to bring those bureaucracies together so that they can work uh, productively for people with mental health difficulties or indeed somatic difficulties. Uh, it's a very interesting problem. And we know it's not just a question of putting the money flows together. That doesn't work. It needs to be really integrated with people knowing each other and uh, social care very much co-creating with the medical professionals uh, around what patients really need. So this this area, I think, is is very tragically holding us back in the effectiveness of of, of, of treating mental health difficulties. Mm, yeah, thank thank you, Jim. You, you talked a little bit there about the evidence base and lived experience and. Again, in the paper, you, you, you talk very clearly about peer support and multidisciplinary approaches such as open dialogue, and you mentioned recovery colleges, and all those things strike me as very important. But certainly here in the UK, I, I'm assuming the Netherlands is the same and, and the US is similar too. It's actually quite hard, I think, to find really good examples of lived experience input to the evidence base. And I, I just wondered, if, you know, if that was the case with you too, and, and how we should go about bringing lived experience in from the cold and ensure that that valuable lived experience is captured and, and used to inform our services. Yeah. So I think that's 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 a key question, actually. So what, what we saw in the so what we use is is things like randomized trials and 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 other classical ways of investigating effects of treatments. And we know that in the UK and also here in the Netherlands, we've had randomized controlled trials actually around uh, user uh, interventions or, or peer support, for example, or, uh, you know, uh, making a crisis chart or shared decision making. And what we saw is that the level of organizational readiness to conduct those trials within the mental health services is very low so that the trials uh, tend to fail or, or not be conclusive. So what we propose in the paper is actually organize this entirely differently. And for example, to organize uh, action research. So for example, create in 10 different areas in the Netherlands, uh, pilot areas with uh, a well-equipped uh, recovery center, for example, a recovery academy where uh, entirely staffed by uh, peer workers, and peer support, and, and have them organize the recovery uh, academy for a number of years, and then literally evaluate how it works. Looking at, uh, for example, in a particular region, at you know who comes there, how many people come there, what do they tell uh, others about the experience? How does it affect their interactions with the traditional mental health services in the same area? For example, do you see that uh, there's less complex there and that there's less hospital admissions? Do you see that there's less suicides, less uh, consumption of psychotropics? Do you see that people are moving on more towards peer, peer support workers, uh, that, that they get a job as a peer support worker themselves? Or that they do voluntary uh, work more or that, et cetera. So you can uh, study these things. So we, 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 what we try to do is create pilot areas where we take money from the social care domain to create a recovery academy where uh, open dialogue experiments, uh, new community teams with uh, a high number of peer support workers using uh, narrative therapies in the same area, make them available, create retreats associated with the recovery academy run by peer support workers, and then evaluate what sort of impacts the introduction of these types of services have on 
the use of the traditional mental health services, psychotropic medications, uh, but also living circumstances, uh, whether people have daytime activities or, or have a job or voluntary work, education, etc. I think this is a much better way of studying it because there's so little now. There's only a huge amount of traditional mental health services. This is very little in terms of peer support work and, and novel forms of, of work so that you can very easily study the impacts these services have once you introduce them in the mainstream uh, area. So that's what we try to do now. And we have so many data in uh, going around that we think, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to uh, actually collect a lot of data because we're so data hungry already in the Netherlands and any Western country that you can just, just use existing data to show differences in the patterns. Uh, and that's a much more interesting way than organizing a randomized controlled trial and find that it fails because there's not enough organizational readiness to include that type of working in, in the system where you want to evaluate a randomized controlled trial. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I know in the UK, we, we currently have um, an NHS based open dialogue, randomized control trial going on. In fact, I, I spoke to one of the leads of that a while ago. And, and so Jim, do, do you think there's enough evidence already accumulated that a kind of multidisciplinary recovery college type approach is is successful enough to you know for us to start putting money and effort into setting them up or do you still think there's work needed to try and establish their efficacy compared to mainstream methods well actually i, I don't i don't but that, that's the thing we're so addicted to randomized controlled trials uh, but but what we fail to see is that actually in mental health they are not conclusive at all randomized controlled trials uh, what, what we see in randomized controlled trials is that there's still a debate, a very lively debate, an important debate, whether, for example, something like antidepressants work at all. We, 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 we're not really sure whether what sort of signal we get from the trials and what we find, and, and the same is for cognitive behavior therapy. Uh, you know, we, we very proudly say it's the only evidence-based psychotherapy for depression. But actually, if you look at the evidence, that's not true. What we see in randomized controlled trials is that the heterogeneity in mental health and the changes we see of individuals who have mental health difficulties are so personal and so heterogeneous that unfortunately, randomized controlled trials is, is not a good instrument uh, to actually produce guidelines telling all patients you should do this. And that's unfortunate, but we have now formal evidence of this as well. There was recently a paper published in a very prestigious scientific journal showing basically that the, the, the mean measure of, for example, a symptom dimension in a group and the change of that over time in the group is disconnected, is not informative with regards to the multitude of personal changes uh, in that group. Uh, and it's a bit difficult, uh, but actually what happens is the factor of time. Uh, mental difficulties and the way people deal with them do not change in a way that you can predict what a particular treatment is going to do. It is too personal and too variable within persons to uh, say what happens uh, you know, between groups can be applied to an individual person over time. This is a very simple statistical evidence-based given. Uh, and I think we should take that seriously. And randomized controlled trials, we know, have a lot of problems in terms of they, they tend to be you know, uh, valid, but are they representative for the average population in mental health services? We know not. And we know that there's a lot of effects you know, the, the antidepressants uh, medications are treated against placebo, but we know the placebo is lacking side effects so that people know what medication they're on. And uh, that has all sorts of effects. And we also know that uh, the difference with placebo is very, very small. Uh, uh, a large part of the treatment effects in psychopharmacology trials is due to the ritual of being in a treatment. And we tend to completely ignore that and not find it interesting and focus on the little bit extra that perhaps is added by 
the DNTB present. And it's the same with psychology trials. We know that all, all psychotherapies for depression work. Literally, they all work. They all have the same effect size. But why would that be? And, you know, uh, so, so, and the simple ones work as well as the complex ones. So why are we not interested in what really could it be that it's just, this is an old theory, of course, but that is really about relationship and hope and expectation and disclosure and these very powerful relationalist effects that uh, a human encounter can bring about, that this is what really helps. Um, so you could, you could argue, you could, you could equally argue, I think, that love is the most powerful evidence-based treatment in mental health care rather than cognitive behavior therapy or antidepressants. I think you would not be, you would be very evidence-based to say that, uh, but we're shying a little bit away from that. But of course, it's fascinating now that we really get now uh, interesting systematic reviews and analyses uh, really discussing this. And that's that's hopeful, I think, because it's exactly where we are meeting the user knowledge uh, we have accumulated over the last 40 years, which is saying exactly the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I'm really, you know, really pleased you mentioned the kind of treatments and the placebo response there, Jim, because again, uh, you, you bring out in the paper that there's evidence for a 30 to 40 percent placebo response for, for most treatments. And there's a fascinating graph comparing um, psychopathology with oncology in terms of how much of the response is placebo. And it's quite small for oncology, but it's very large in, in mental health. And so I, I guess the question for me there is, are, are we in danger of overestimating the impact of psychiatric in interventions simply because we're not as aware as we should be of the effect of the expectation of being helped as you described yeah so so that that's the core question of course so we we are we if 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 we say well the, in terms of tumor growth the placebo effects are negligible in oncology whereas in terms of mental outcomes they are very large in any treatment research in mental health then uh, what we really are saying uh, is perhaps that uh, what happens in what we call placebo is maybe is the core of uh, what we have to offer in terms of treatment. Um, but that would be a painful conclusion because then uh, it, would, it would really be saying that uh, experienced professionals have learned to interact in such a way with other people that by providing hope and uh, by helping people find words to describe their stories and to uh, raise expectations and to offer a relationship and really human concern, true human concern, that we can actually help people deal with mental health difficulties. That would be a fantastic discovery you know, worth the Nobel Prize possibly if we were to take it seriously. Um, but I think still the discourse is very much that we know there's a huge placebo effect. We know the additive effect of active treatments like antidepressants and cognitive behavior therapy are quite small. Um, but we don't really teach that to our students or indeed uh, take it seriously enough because I think it would, it would have implications for the training of mental health professionals. Uh, do mental health professionals really learn how to maximize these effects that have to do with relationship and concern and trust and hope and expectation and connectedness? How do you, how do you teach professionals indeed to maximize the effects? Uh, and of course, maybe we do need some sort of treatment rationale. Maybe we need to say to people, well, we, we use this technique because we think it is very productive. It can be CBT or even sometimes a, a molecule uh, if we know it may have a certain effect in, in a, even a subgroup of people. But uh, uh, I think it would have implications for the training of professionals. And then we would also understand why peer support can be so effective because perhaps these qualities uh, uh, peer support workers know naturally are very important. So then they're much more naturally inclined to work in that fashion. Uh, 
So still, I'm not saying we should do away with psychologists and psychiatrists and, and, uh, and, and nurses, but I think what they are effective not because of their technological guideline-based uh, practice. They are effective because of their experience. I think somebody who has been doing psychotherapy for 10 years uh, has developed skills in relationship building uh, and, 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 you know, uh, 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 using the relationship to get people to uh, uh, work on themselves and, and feel better. Uh, and maybe they would have forgotten about the techniques. And they say they do CBT, but I think what they do is differently. And also some of the medications in psychiatry that we use that have reasonably good, reasonable good, reasonably good papers like lithium. Um, you know, if you have a clinician who knows lithium very well, has been prescribing it for 10 years and knows it's a molecule that in some people can have effects, but you should be very uh, careful and skeptical and not necessarily believe this is the solution for everybody, but that the people can try it, you know, in their attempt to recover, and that you have a lot of experience of what it may do in certain people, then I think that's valuable as well. So, Jim, I, I guess more broadly then on, on looking at the medication angle, if we're saying the benefit of medication is often quite small and, and obviously focuses only on symptoms, is there an argument then for for trying to reduce prescribing and using the money freed up to invest in training, you know, new psychologists and psychiatrists in the relationship building aspects of treatment? For example, yes. Um, so what we already see happening, I think, is that uh, well, the other the, 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 you could you could ask the question in a different fashion and saying. Is the evidence that if you stop taking your medication, that you have a relapse, is that really sound scientific evidence? And then, of course, there's much that can be said on this evidence. And uh, clearly, uh, the case is not nearly as solid as we used to think. So take, for example, antipsychotics. Um, if you've been taking antipsychotics for three years, then of course, if you if you stop, we haven't we, we don't know what actually what sort of sec secondary changes the, the, the medication is is inducing uh, in in the cerebral physiology of of people. So if you stop taking the medication, then of course people may suffer a relapse. But we it is really difficult to know whether to what degree this is due to the secondary changes brought about by the medications in the first place. So what you need uh, to, to study is, is we need more careful studies People where, where people slowly reduce their medications. And of course, at some stage, they will have the, uh, maybe psychotic experiences will appear. But the treatment of anxiety, for example, is very much to learn to deal with that anxiety and to, to be exposed to that anxiety, then overcome it. Whereas in the in, 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 in psychosis, it is very much about uh, suppression only. But why not why not have a model that people actually also very gradually and very carefully are exposed to psychotic experiences and, and learn to deal with them and cope with them? As indeed, you know, there's this in psychotherapy or using mindfulness or using virtual reality, etc. So I think there's there's uh, a movement that you're seeing that many patients now are experimenting actively with their medications and realizing they will experience psychosis, but that that is not the end of everything. That, that, that may be seen as part of the experiment and that uh, try to keep it safe enough to learn how to deal with that and build resilience to deal with psychosis. I think that's a very interesting model. Also because antipsychotics, we know, interfere with the reward system. And the reward system, of course, is, is so inherent to uh, uh, living a meaningful life in the sense of deriving pleasure from things that if the medication interferes with that, uh, you have a big problem. We, we call that negative symptoms. And we know that uh, these, 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 these alterations in motivation uh, are in part caused by the medication itself. 
uh, and they also have sexual side effects. So um, we should much more actively, I think, try to see medication as a temporary thing and that the long-term recovery process is something that is uh, should should be started from the beginning in terms of building resilience, uh, learning to live with this particular way of reacting to the circumstances in light of one's life history. And that medication may be a temporary thing to help you with that process. Thank you, Jim. I, I'd got another question about, um, and again, we've already kind of mentioned this, that the paper suggests that an existential component be added to the social, biological and psychological domains. But again, it, it, perhaps, I, <laughs> perhaps I'm too much of an old cynic. But it strikes me that adding another component might not itself lead to the paradigm shift that some of us are looking for. It might end up, I feel, still subservient to the medical or biological. So I just wanted to ask, should the existential domain actually become the primary lens through which we view all emotional suffering? Yes, yes. So, so sorry, I, I, I maybe I, I didn't explain that clearly. So uh, what we see in somatic medicine clearly is that now People are trying to look through the prism of medical technology, uh, of the value that that technology can add to a person's life, uh, namely his existence. And it's exactly the same in mental health care. I think I think we should look through the prism of our professional uh, uh, evidence and technologies uh, of of what can this add to a person's uh, existence in the sense of where is this person going, uh, what's his purpose in life, what's what's his goal, and uh, what adds value to this person's life, what is important in his life, what is he struggling with. And that's different, entirely different from saying what are the symptoms and how can we reduce them. That's no longer the, the main question. The main question is, how can we help this person get his life uh, and also his struggle in life? How can we assist the person with that? And if we have something, a technical treatment that can help with that, that's fine. But uh, if it doesn't add, if there's no value in that, then and if it if it uh, has more side effects to that process, then then it adds. Then clearly we shouldn't do it. So the existential domain is primary rather than uh, uh, um, of the, because it's central to the others. Uh, you, the, the person, of course, is, is if you want to do person-based healthcare, then you have to start with the person and what adds value to a person's life. And that question, you can only, uh, there's no guideline for that or there's no algorithm for that. You really have to talk to the person and understand his story before you know what this person is about. So the guidelines do not apply because it's so ideographic, so personal that you can't describe it in terms of evidence-based practice. So that's why it's very safe to start there because then you're protected against uh, putting people into groups that aren't there. Yeah, I, I I can see why this idea could you know could be a real change, and I can see also why some would find it threatening because you can't write a guideline for every individual circumstance, can you? And the, and the general nature of group experience is very different to the unique nature of each personal experience. And uh, you know, I, I guess you know, there's so much more value then in the the interacting with the person rather than saying you 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 generally fit these criteria. Yeah. And, and I think the sad thing is, is that, um, you know, it looks like it's, it's, it's a very simple idea and that, of course, this is an, an evident truth. But, uh, what I, what I notice I, when I'm in debates, particularly in the US, uh, people will suggest this is all about a political hope, hoax about giving people false hope of, uh, improvement and that really, what we should do is act as doctors and not be shy of our role as doctors and take the lead and tell the diagnosis and get the person to take the medication. Because in the end, that's the only thing between them and miserable, uh, miserable fate and suicide. And, and um, I think there's a lot of hostility towards the idea of putting the existential domain central 
and take it seriously and organize what we can add with care around that existential domain. Uh, people call it vague. Uh, they say, you know, this is, this is, this is not something we can work with. And of course, insurers and funders not ne- are not necessarily very happy either, because how do you measure outcomes in the existential domains? How do you measure living beyond your diagnosis? Um, and uh, so how, how do you get the market to compete uh, around outcomes in the existential domain? Uh, and that, that those are real questions I think we, we should also deal with. I think we should try to teach funders and uh, reimbursers and insurers that there's other ways to evaluate quantitatively, if you want to do that, than uh, taking measures from each and every single patient in a service and then collect it in a big database of symptom reduction measures or whatever. I think we should evaluate the effectiveness of a mental health service at the population level. We should look at uh, the population after 10 years in, in, the, in the cer- or five years in a certain living in a certain area with certain mental health services and looking at how many people make use of the services. Um, you know, how many people are using antidepressants? How many children are using uh, Ritalin? How many forced admissions are there? Uh, how many suicides? How many suicide attempts? How many people who have had contact with mental health services are working or having voluntary jobs or uh, uh, are in education? Those, those are population measures that I think will pick up very well if a mental health service is doing its work. So the mental health service should actually not measure things quantitatively with each and every patient and put that in a database and then have the market compete against who gets the most reduction in whatever measure you come up with. I don't think that's a good model because also it's always confounded and clouded by a hundred thousand factors. Yeah, and it strikes me that you know that, that there is there is a reasonable amount of work gone on in, in recent years, certainly in, in, in the richer countries, I guess, to try and understand the metrics of happiness and try and understand and measure, yeah. you know, how do you define the happiness of, our, of, a, of a community or a, a, a town or a city or a country? And, you know, th- those, those kind of things feed into that, don't they? Yes. So, well, what is fascinating to me is that, for example, if you compare Italy and the Netherlands, uh, uh, then there are some very striking differences. First, that Italy spends spends much less per person on healthcare and mental healthcare. Uh, uh, access to mental healthcare and healthcare is much more difficult. Yet, uh, the longevity of the Italians is is two to three years longer, uh, and is uh, and the difference with Netherlands is increasing. Uh, and they have less chronic depression and less suicide. And, you know, if you think of this, then what, what is driving this difference? It's not just the somatic outcomes and longevity. It's also, uh, you know, chronic depression, suicide, and presumably the average level of, of well-being in the Italian population. Clearly, uh, this is not because we have so many... Uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and mental health services providing treatment a symptom reduction um, because we're doing, you know, that it doesn't seem to create any difference with Italy. And our suicide rates are increasing and theirs are in- decreasing. So these, these are, this, this is really key, I think. So the uh, very interesting hypothesis, if you can look at this from uh, the level of group cohesion and family cohesion, and you know, old-fashioned uh, uh, social links that are still conserved in Italy compared to, uh, for example, the Netherlands, uh, and and social solidarity perhaps that's more intact, uh, particularly inside the family. So these are the things that I think we should be looking for in terms of what what drives well-being at the population level, uh, and what what can a mental health service add to that? Because I think. Uh, a community will do well if those with mental health difficulties in their midst are uh, finding solace and real help with 
uh, good services like uh, a recovery academy or open dialogue interventions, connected connectedness, offering connectedness, and and you know easy ways to meet other people and peer support. I think that will add to the whole community. And then that type of intervention perhaps will show at the population level uh, in the same fashion as it does in Italy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jim. And, and as we come towards the close, you, you kind of touched on a little bit of, there, of, of, of this there already, but what, what kind of reaction or response have you had to the paper? I appreciate it only came out in early January, didn't it? So it's not in the wild for that long yet. But I just wondered if you'd had any interesting reactions to it. Very, very interesting reactions. I've, I've, uh, I've had, the, the, uh, for example, uh, there were uh, different people from different areas in Mexico writing to me uh, and from Spain uh, saying, look, you know, we are uh, busy doing the same thing and, and uh, uh, we want your help. We want, we want you to explain this to our uh, local authorities. And uh, we are developing, uh, they call it Nueva Psiquiatria. Um, so uh, very much the same movement, and I've had reactions from France and from Germany, uh, from Scandinavian countries, from the U.S. Uh, uh, people asking, you know, we we are trying to do something similar, uh, and and uh, it, I think it's interesting to try and link these experiences with each other because they're the pockets of pilots uh, that the people are undertaking. In, in, in sometimes it's just action research and sometimes it's just in a, a local experiment. But I think it's it's interesting to connect these with each other. I, I've also had skeptical reactions, you know, saying, "Well, this is all very well, uh, you know, but uh, we can't we can't possibly call a mental health service a healing community." Um, you know, this this is simply, uh, you know, uh, I won't work in a healing community. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've studied for eight years. Uh, you know, what, what? Why? Why do you talk about a healing community? And uh, why should love be an evidence-based intervention? You haven't had randomized controlled trials, etc. So, the, <laughs> so, so, but but I think that's important. You know, the debate is nice. I think we should have debates about this. Uh, and, and look at, at where, where this is all going to, because I'm convinced it, it is going somewhere. And that the way the, the total controllability, malleability, uh, uh, accountability, reliability of the current mental health system uh, is, is, is not providing what people need. And they become more and more vocal in telling us that this is not a good system. So we will have to change eventually. Jim, thank you so much um, for again taking the time to chat. And uh, I, I just want to say I very much appreciate the thought and effort that goes into your work and, and just your openness to addressing some of the issues and concerns that, that some of us out there have with traditional or mainstream psychiatry. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me. So I just want to thank Jim for taking the time to chat with me for the podcast and to say that you can find a link to the paper we discussed on the post that accompanies this interview on maddenamerica.com. So thanks for listening and until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.